everyone. Welcome to this edition of Uncork Your Mind. I'm your host, Debbie G. Aquindo. I'm the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. And this episode, I speak with Sean Pierce of Familia Vincent Pierce down in Mendoza, Argentina. And we have a really funny story how we got together. I make no bones about it. I'm a Buffalo Bills fan. I spent four years in college in Buffalo, became a huge fan. And Sean reached out to me on the Bills Mafia page. And he private messaged me and we decided to do a podcast on his wine. So I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to Uncork Your Mind, where we take the intimidation out of wine with your host, Debbie Giaquindo, the Hudson Valley wine goddess. Hello, hello. Here we are. Hey, how are you? Uh, we're on. We're live. Great. Uh, I'm with Sean from family Vincent Pierce. Um, and for all those that don't know me, I'm Debbie G. Aquindo. I'm the Hudson Valley wine goddess. And um, I met Vincent, actually, um, Buffalo Bills. I've got my new Buffalo Bills sweatshirt on. My a friend of mine gave this to me the other day. Go so man. I thought, what? Go Bills. Yes, I thought I thought it would be appropriate to wear it to this interview. <laughs> so um, I'm a big Buffalo Bills fan because I went to college in Buffalo where I became a Bills fan because I never liked the New York fan, uh, the New York teams. And I was big into football and um, football brought Sean and I together. Um, so we you know established I went to school in Buffalo. Um, Sean, where did you go to college and, you know, how did all this shape your career and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, uh, yeah, I obviously grew up in Buffalo. I went to college at Wake Forest in North Carolina, okay. and it is kind of a critical piece of this. Um, I studied abroad in London. I started getting into food and wine. I, you know, met and hung out with some kids in culinary school when I was there. And when I came back to college, I was talking with a professor, uh, Dr. Clay Hip was his name, in the business school there. And he had a vineyard in North Carolina. So I said, why don't we start a wine tasting club and, you know, get students from, you know, our classes to come and try some stuff and learn about wine. And he was all about it. And yeah, that, that's kind of how actually the whole thing started. It was at Wake Forest. Um, I did go on to get a graduate degree maybe five or six years later, and then another almost five, seven, eight years after that, I did the winemaking certification, the two-year program at UC Davis. So I'd say this whole thing's been a really long journey on the Pierce side. And then on the Vicente side, my wife, Celia Vicente, she's the one that grew up in Mendoza. Um, so when we got married, that created Familia Vicente Pierce. When and how did, how did you meet your wife? We met in a 25 cent beer reggae bar in Boca Raton, Florida. It was pretty <laughs> random. Yeah. Uh, I was, I took a year off my job. I quit and did a backpacking trip kind of around the world. I was in Cuba and came back through South Florida where a roommate of mine grew up in Boca Raton. And Celia was on vacation. Uh, she was living in New York City on vacation for her birthday in South Florida. She went to go meet Brazilian surfer guys and she met a guy from Buffalo by accident. And um, I was actually flying to her hometown of Mendoza the following week as part of my trip to go, um, you know, check out Argentina and, and go skiing. So that was kind of my excuse to stay in touch. Did she go with you? No, no. She was in New York. She was in the U.S. You know, I was going with uh, a guy from high school, a guy from college and, you know, spending a month down in Argentina. But yeah, when I came back, I I, I called her and, you know, eventually I moved to New York City and that's kind of when it all got serious. Oh, that's nice. So you moved to the city. She was in the city. And yep. and um, and what was she what was her line of work in the city? She's a makeup artist. Um, so Very she cool. worked in New York for a number of years doing uh, film and television makeup. So everything from. You know, she did a lot of History Channel work. She worked mm -hmm. on some uh, independent films, too. Um, yeah, that's what, that's what she did. So she continues with kind of her artistic side, uh, making some of our labels, right? Our, I was going to ask you. I'm going to get yeah. into that. Yes, because yeah. I really like this yeah, label. Yeah. So, yeah, she's kind of our, um, you know, head of design. 
So how was your journey? I mean, you said you started with the wine club, you got your UC Davis, and then then you guys got married. And now what inspired all of you, you know, the two of you to embark on a path of, of winemaking and owning a label? Yeah, I mean, I think there's two parallel stories here, right? Celia growing up in Argentina and being around wine her whole life. It's it's the fifth largest wine producing country in the world. Mm -hmm. And 75% of all wines in Argentina come from Mendoza. So if you can imagine, you know, the industry is huge in that town. It's actually like a Buffalo sized town. It's feels uh -huh. similar. People stop by your house unannounced. You run into someone when you go to the grocery shop. You know, yeah. it's that kind, of, mm -hmm. that's that kind of town. So Celia's brother, Juan Pablo and Celia, we all work, the three of us all work together. Juan Pablo is based in Mendoza. Celia and I are, you know, more than half the year in the U.S. and then probably three months a year in Mendoza. But that journey was, like I said, these kind of two parallel journeys where they were making wine in their backyard with their grandfather with, you know, muscadet grapes and criolla that they bought from uh, neighborhood farms. And, you know, my interest started later when we got together. It wasn't really like, hey, here's the dream. Let's let's buy a vineyard, start a winery and make wine in Mendoza. It was kind of like, that would be amazing if we could do that someday, um, you know, with no thought that it could actually become reality. And we eventually, you know, I did all the research regarding buying land, maybe to have a house there, but also be able to maybe have a vineyard. And we just found that it was pretty affordable. When we were doing the research, we had no money. And then we were living, I eventually moved to Chile. My, my daughter was a baby then, um, you know, that was in 2010. And we were visiting Mendoza every month to go see family. And, you know, finally had saved up some funds to be able to buy a piece of land. And it kind of all came together. 2011, we bought the vineyard in Mendoza. Uh, I was working full time in kind of my other career at the time. So we really set it up as a great growing business. Uh, it was a vineyard planted back in 1990. So we were able to sell grapes through the years until we started making a really small amount of wine. And I mean, those are the roots of the whole thing. That's pretty amazing. That You know what? That It's a passion and it's love. Exactly. All together. <laughs> that's what drives and now, Celia, you said, you know, she does the artistic side. So what is your role? And then what is your brother-in-law's role? Yes, I mean, if you think of us being really small, right? So the, mm -hmm. the, the vineyard's not a garden. It's 46 acres. I mean, you can't just go out there and pull weeds, right? You need to, need to have a real plan. Um, but we kind of all do a lot of things because there's really so few of us. Um, thinking about the actual day-to-day -day staff, you know, we have three farmers that live at the vineyard. Um, you know, we provide them with housing and they're there every day, you know, working Monday through Friday. Um, so that is a, a really key responsibility to actually do the farming, the harvesting, the, the pruning, the running the irrigation system, right? All those kind of things. And then we also have a viticulturalist that specializes in organic viticulture mm -hmm. who kind of oversees our irrigation plan and our fertilization plan. And, you know, what kind of load are we pruning vines to carry? We have a winemaker as well in Argentina. The winery is right down the street from our vineyard. And then uh, Juan Pablo in Mendoza, you know, he's involved in, in really all of those things, you know, keeping everything under control. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, he, you know, he's our local person who, who lives there year round. So, yeah, he's man on the street. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so he's, he's touching everything. Having done the winemaking degree, and really I've read so many books about viticulture and winemaking and all these things. You know, I, I really get involved in, in everything as well, especially, um, you know, plant, planting the wines, <clears throat> uh, working together with, with the winemaker to, to kind of make that plan and with Juan Pablo. Um, you know, how many kilos of grapes do we need to, to harvest? What barrels uh, are, are going to be used for which wines? Do we need to buy more barrels this year? Um, also work with the viticulturists on the fertilization plan. You know, I'm, I'm running through that. Uh, every every year, spring, fall, uh, making sure we get soil tests done to you know ensure that our fertilization is is targeted in the right way, um, and then kind of in the U.S., I'm also the importer, so I bring the wines here, work on all the logistics, all the compliance, all the legality things, and I also manage all the relationships with the distributors. 
and then get on the street and sell and do events. You know, yeah. check out our website and see the list of things we do where, you know, we're out there a lot. Yeah. And, you know, Celia kind of helps me with a lot of that stuff, especially, you know, design. Um, as a 48 year old, I probably shouldn't be in charge of the Instagram account, but yeah, I'm, I'm the Instagram <laughs> guy too. So Celia, well, you know what? This, this I'm, not, I'm the 61 year old in charge of the restaurant Instagram. So, you know, right. so like, you know, Celia, how does this look? Is this, you know, what, what do you think about this photo? Can you edit it for me? Um, you know, and then she's, she's working on events. We do events kind of at our house as well for, um, our FVP VIPs. And, you know, Sally has puts together a lot of that stuff. Um, obviously the label, the label art, um, that she's Okay. Doing. I got a show since we're talking the label art and I put it off last time. Yeah. I'm sitting here looking at this and this is beautiful. I mean, purple is my favorite color, but <laughs> this is just beautiful. It is just stunning. Yeah. We love how that one just, came out. Yeah. So that is the Malbec Rosé and yes. you know, Celia kind of takes inspiration for each label from the vineyard or from the grape or from the place. Um, and it's alcohol ink. From the grape. So the ink is a, a dye mixed with pure alcohol and you manipulate that ink and alcohol together on a piece of paper to make these kind of liquid watercolory kind of, um, you know, features. And then the alcohol evaporates. So depending on how much dye you've or ink you've put in the alcohol, when it evaporates, it makes these darker and lighter colors. So that is, uh, that's a style of art that, you know, she does. We've done some cool events, right? Gallery showings where we serve the wine and have her art on the walls. Um, so yeah, that is uh, oh, wow. know, another fun part of it that makes it still enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, and you really incorporate her talents with everything. I mean, it's not just <laughs> labels, it's her artwork and how art and wine go together. Yeah, for sure. You know, that's, that is great. So what kind of uh, grapes do you grow at your vineyard? So we grow the classic Bordeaux blending varietals, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Malbec, Petit Verdot. There are more approved grapes in Bordeaux, but that is kind of how our vineyard was planted. You know, we, we purchased the land in 2011, but it had already been planted in 1990. So we have, you know, older vines. Those are, those are the reds we have, uh, as well as Gamay. We have one row of Gamay with also planted in 1990 with a pretty interesting story that the famous winemaker who worked for the winery that owned the land that we bought it from, Bodegas Winer, his son studied abroad in France and brought back cuttings of Gamay from Beaujolais to the farm, his, his dad, one of his dad's workplaces, right? And that, that Gamay was propagated across the back fence of our, of our vineyard. And we have one single row, Gamay, from back then, material straight from France, you know, probably, probably got approved coming through customs, but I can't confirm or deny that that actually Might have just been in a might have just been in a suitcase. Yeah. <laughs> that and, is great because I've never seen a gamay from Argentina. Yeah, there's not um, a lot of it planted. People people yeah. come and ask us for prunings from our vines to be able to, to create their own as well. Oh, so you're kind of helping other vineyards establish a gamay production in, in Mendoza. Yeah, yeah, we have. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Like I said, I've never when I when we got in touch and I started reading about you, I'm like, oh my God, they have a Gamay that's so unusual. Cause we have Gamay in New York, yeah, um, in the Hudson Valley. Um, and I'm like, and there's Gamay in the Finger Lakes. And I'm just like, you know, outside Beaujolais, I'm like, and, and New York, I, I don't see a lot of Gamay. And I think there's Gamay in Oregon as well. Yeah. Yeah, and it's really, it makes a really pretty wine in Argentina. You know, we have made a red out of that wine in the past, but we really focus every year now on making a rosé. I, I think rose. that's a great expression of that, of that grape mm -hmm. in Mendoza. Um, it's, it's really pretty and floral and just a, a lot of flowers, a lot of fresh strawberry. It's a, it's a pretty mm -hmm. color. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, that one, we have one row, so we make between 40 and 80 cases a year, and it just... It goes pretty quick, but, uh, I bet. but yeah, that's a, that's a fun one. Yeah. 
Now, how does the terroir and the climate in Mendoza impact the great varieties that you grow in the in the space that you have? Because is there a lot of elevation or is it in the valley? Yeah, I mean, we're at 3,000 feet above sea level. Okay. Um, you know, you have vineyards that get pretty high in Argentina. I think the highest one's probably even close to 6,000, maybe up in Salta. Um, and there are also valley floor vineyards, you know, more to the east of us. But Mendoza, we're in the Primera Zona, it's called, like first zone, which is mm -hmm. Maipú and Luján de Cuyo. So that is like where vineyards were historically originally planted um, around 200 years ago in Mendoza. So we are in the just south of the city at about 3,000 feet. Um, I think we are pretty lucky in that we actually sit just above if you look at a satellite picture of Mendoza, there's a, there's a really big dry riverbed, Rio Mendoza, the mm -hmm. Mendoza River. Um, that's just below us. So cold air coming down from the mountains. We get some frost damage sometimes, but often um, that, that cool drops down into that dry riverbed and kind of gets sucked out east and south, uh, kind of saving us sometimes from, from, from some of the cold snaps after bud break. Uh, in terms of terroir, like soil things, um, you know, it's it's uh, alluvial soil. So we have, you know, these big round uh, river rocks from, you know, a long, long time ago when water kind of ran through that area. Um, that's a little bit under the topsoil. Topsoil is quite thin um, in terms of its depth, you know, 40 to 60 centimeters. Um, and we have kind of a mix of sand, loam, and these stones. And even in our 46 acres, it, it varies a pretty decent amount uh, from from one side to the other. So, you know, we have to be aware in terms of, you know, irrigation and things like that, um, you know, how much a, how much grape a vine can sustain when we plan for pruning and things. So it's it's pretty precision in terms of how you need to manage things. But I think the, the big message is the altitude gives us cool nights even in the summertime the temperature shift from day to night is pretty big in mendoza you know it can easily be 30 degrees fahrenheit and that means if you picture grapes maturing sugar is always going up and acid is always going down mm -hmm. so throughout the season the overnight cool retains acid and kind of stops the process of acid falling and sugar rising and then when the sun comes back out it continues again but that break allows Mendoza to produce phenomenal wines that are recognized around the world. So um, that is the retention of acidity and balance with sugar so that the alcohol and acid can, can create a really nice balanced wine. And I think that's a good lead in to taste. Oh yeah, I like that idea. So we, I have the Malbec Rosé we'll start with. Yeah, which I have a right before. here. So on the back, I, the back of this bottle, there is a, um, sketch of a looks like a bear oh it's a little dog i'm sorry it's a little dog yeah oh it's a dog yeah <laughs> is what's the significance of that is that your dog no not really i mean it's it's a shout out to all the farm dogs um you okay. know at our vineyard we have there are always dogs there and it's really the main reason why our kids wanted to visit the vineyard because there's always dogs there's always a few puppies um so you know we're just recognizing the fact that uh they're there they're definitely a big component of the atmosphere they, uh -huh. they greet people when they show up they're unfortunately not very scary for people who, that show up that you don't want there but um <laughs> but yeah and also you know our head our head farmer um jose is uh is a big fan of dogs so he's actually rescued a few dogs that you know, he found injured under the bridge down the road. You know, I mean, we we always have some dogs there. So yeah, we have that that sketch on all of our labels on the back. Yeah, it's on the red one as well. Yeah, it's on the red one as well. That's nice. So let's taste this. It smells beautiful. Yeah. So these this is um, you know cold maceration mm -hmm. um, pressed after probably six or seven hours to get this color. It's it's a pale salmon color. Um, Beautiful. That actually gives this wine, you know, nice color, but also a little bit of texture. You can tell that if you have, you know, a, a lighter style rosé followed by this rosé, it just has a little bit of palate weight, which mm. has made this wine super flexible. Like, we, everyone uh, loves to drink it on its own. Thank you. 
but also yeah, this is beautiful. There's notes of like raspberry and there's floral um, on the nose, but it's fresh. A lot of freshness on yeah. the nose. Yeah, fresh plum, fresh raspberry, uh, violet. Someone told mm -hmm. me it's like begonia. I'm not an expert on what that flower smells mm -hmm. like, but uh, some people confirm mm -hmm. that's the one. Um, can't be an expert in everything. And on the palate, it's just, once again, it's fresh, very, it kind of dances on my palate. It's just kind of, um, it, it's light, it's fresh, it, it's beautiful. It's got um, nice um, hints of just some red notes, and it's just really delightful. Good, I'm glad you like it. So oh, I was I saying this wine, obviously great on its own. We love to just drink it, you know, stick it in a bucket of ice. But when we do wine dinners where a chef kind of brainstorms mm -hmm. what wines go with what food, you know, they have creative license. It's their restaurant to do something cool. And this wine, you know, our most recent dinner was with um, like a hamachi crudo with a plum sauce, kind of bringing out the plum Ooh, note. I can see that. I just awesome. had some of that the other day. Yeah. I mean, awesome but, pairing. But a few uh -huh. months before that, someone paired um, the rosé with, with uh, like seared lamb chops. So if you think about I can the, see that too. Yeah, so if you think about the difference in those two yeah. foods, like this can work. Huge. It's just really flexible because but of yeah. that freshness and acidity. And I can see the gaminess of the lamb going well with the rosé. Yeah, yeah, amazing that it worked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Chefs are pretty, pretty cool yeah, on how they do kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then the next one we have, now this is kind of, this is the, um, I can't pronounce it. You can pronounce it, the vineyard. Oh, Asquenaga is the name of the vineyard. Yes. So yeah, we have that on all of our labels. Like we are Familia Vicente Pierce. That's the winery. That's us. Right. Um, oh, that's the name of the vineyard. Yep. Yeah, Asquenaga is the name of the vineyard. We want to give that shout out that like these grapes are coming from a single source. They're coming from our property. Um, so Asquenaga Vineyard is something we highlight. That label was designed by this uh, great great designer in Argentina named Gato Ficardi. He came up with this idea to kind of, well, we asked him for a woodcut print. We gave him, you know, a decent write-up about kind of our philosophy and what we were looking for. We, we said two words, embody Argentina and the wine industry, uh, elegant and rustic. So people will weld, like farmers will weld together their own equipment on the farm, but also you go to a wine event and it's, stainless steel tanks and people dress super well. So like this elegant and rustic thing coming together uh -huh. is kind of, we wanted to capture that with a piece of art that was a woodcut print. And he had this idea to, um, you know, stand at the vineyard and kind of squint. And if you're there in the winter and all the leaves are off the vines, the wooden posts of which we have thousands and thousands of them uh -huh. are not really straight, right? They're all pieces right. of wood that are natural bends and knots and things like that. So if you stand at a certain angle, they kind of all line up and it, it creates this image, right? That's, it's cool. that's like all of these irregular lines together. And then we just snuck in the words as Quenaga inside the vineyard posts. Um, so yeah, that's the, uh, that's the label. It has a little texture to it, right? So you get that kind of rustic yep. feel, but it has an elegant look. So yep. Uh, we think we that, that he nailed it on this one. I think that when I look at a vineyard now in the middle of winter, it's <laughs> going to be a different perspective because thinking about things, that's what that's what you see. Yeah, that's what you see. Yeah. And, and that, some snow mountains in the background. That is that is really pretty cool. So, do you source any grapes, or everything is made on your own vineyard? We we grow seven of eight of our wines. So the eighth wine is the Chardonnay, and mm -hmm. there's actually a winemaker for a pretty big winery in Argentina that loves our Petit Verdot. So we planted Petit Verdot only six or seven years ago, and he started making wine with it in the third year, which is pretty early. He was a big fan of his mm -hmm. grapes. We kind of um, arranged for a grape swap. They have a 40-hectare yeah. Chardonnay vineyard in Agrelo, mm -hmm. so that's where we get the Chardonnay from. Oh, that's a pretty good uh, swap. Yeah. This yeah, is really good. good. This is really nice. So that you have the Cab or the Corte? I have, I have the Cabernet 2021. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I'm, I love this wine right now. I mean, mm -hmm. I I've absolutely love all of our wines for sure. We we only make wines that we love. Um, 
but this is showing super well right now. And it's the first time we made kind of like a commercial quantity of Cabernet Sauvignon. 2018, we, we made like an experimental barrel, 27 cases. Um, it had only been in our blends before. So in 2021, we started making, you know, purposefully enough Cabernet uh, to be able to label it, bottle it and, you know, get it out in the world. So there's only 215 cases of this made. This mm -hmm. is, I, I would say this is probably perfect. Like in, in the scale of your, of the bell shaped curve, this is just, it's really drinking nice. Yeah. I'm loving it. The aromas right are nice. Um, now tell me a little bit about this. It says here, um, it was 12 months in, uh, big cask oak, uh, Barrels? Yeah. Yeah. So our reds, you know, kind of our philosophy is to mm -hmm. show the wine first. So that means, you know, pretty, pretty non-interventionalist winemaking. Mm -hmm. um, the oak program is to highlight the wine, not the wood. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, 225 liter, you know, the standard barrels you see in mm -hmm. any winery mm -hmm. and 500 liter. So mm -hmm. Almost all of our new barrel purchases are 500 liters. And if you think about that wood square footage to per liter of wine, mm -hmm. mis mixing the metric system and not, you know, it's a little confusing, but the surface area of, of wood to wine is lower in a larger barrel. Mm -hmm. So that means the, the oak influence is a little bit less direct. And wines get better with a year in oak, right? Partially because of stabilization. You don't have to, you know, push them around through filters as much. Um, you get micro oxygenation in a wine barrel. You obviously get the influence of the wood. So if we have 500 liter and 225 barrels and the new ones are 500s, all of our oak is French mm -hmm. and it's medium minus toast. So the actual toasting of the barrel is fairly light. And the toast is a convection toast. So it's it's extremely controlled, right? When the staves go through the oven, it's not a barrel with a flame in the middle, which is super romantic and I love to see it and smell it. But, you know, this is just very standardized so that we know that the oak is coming out, you know, as planned. The wine shines, the wood supports, and that's kind of what we're after. You're absolutely right because the oak is there, but it's not overbearing. Yeah, and you have, you have like grippy tannins on the finish that kind of like grip to you as it as it finishes and it's saying, saying goodbye. Um, it, it's got nice fruit. Um, it's really lovely. Thank it's, you. It's, it'll be nice. Um, today's my anniversary. Oh, nice it's anniversary. So this will go nice with our dinner tonight. <laughs> oh, that's a good plan. Let me know if you come with any good pairings. Yeah, we're having. I think we're having veal. Oh, so. Good. So yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll go nice. Per it'd be perfect. <laughs> Love that. But, um, so can you talk about, uh, the vineyard sustainable practices and the steps that you do to ensure the environmental responsibility? Cause I know that I, I believe you are, um, no, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I actually recently put this, all this information on my website because people ask and, you know, it's, I think it's good to kind of document what you're doing and, you know, be transparent mm -hmm. about it. Um, I'd say that the first sustainable step we did was right after we bought, the farm. actually before we even closed on the farm, we kind of planned out converting from flood irrigation to drip irrigation. It's, it's more than a 50% uh, reduction in water usage. And in Argentina, Mendoza in particular is very dry. Uh, it's about eight inches of average rainfall a year. And the vineyard needs 20. There's a lot of agriculture in Mendoza, kind of surprisingly. And it's all from the snow in the Andes Mountains. If you, you know, you look at a picture of Mendoza or any winery, they're going to have the, the snow capped Andes Mountains in the background. That snow melts and comes into a, a big dam up in the mountains and then is kind of dispersed through a canal system to the city. So that would be, you know, everything from drinking water and irrigation water. Um, and, and for farming, that means that we have a canal just the size of a ditch in front of your house, right? It's not very big. Mm -hmm. That is one of the branches of the, of the mountain water. 
that gets opened by the Department of Irrigation. Um, I think it's once a week for 72 hours we, we have a water right. So they open it up, the water starts running in, uh, and it goes into a reservoir, which we dug, you know, also the first year that we owned the vineyard. So you put in a reservoir, capture that water, put in the pumps, strung all the lines with the drip emitter, emitters throughout the vineyard. And now we can control, you know, very, very specifically how much water the, the vines get and when. And we're not just letting that water, when it comes through the canal, um, you know, flood the ear, flood the, the vineyard to do our watering. So, you know, much more, much more precision. So that, that was kind of like step one. We also converted to um, organic farming. I mean, we use organic uh, fertilizers. Um, we stopped using herbicides probably seven years ago. We do a lot of weed whacking, a lot of hoeing. Um, our insect control is also organically approved practices like the European grapevine moth, Lobesia, mm -hmm. it's called in Argentina is um, you know, one of the kind of fearful pests in, in a vineyard. And we use pheromone emitters that are hung throughout the vineyard that kind of confuse the, the moths they're not reproducing at the property. Um, so yeah, th there's a lot, of, a lot of those types of things we do. We also, you know, we provide housing for our farmers who live there. Um, you know, they, they have, we, we contribute to their pension system and to their uh, medical insurance. So we kind of we do a little bit of everything. We do all the, you know, all those right steps to, right. Uh, to ensure sustainability. And then in the bottling, you know, from, from day one, we've only bought recycled glass and relatively lightweight bottles, um, you know, 330 grams. If you, if you notice, it's just the normal weight, yeah. but you know, there are bottles that are three times heavier. There's a lot of bottles that are two times heavier. The average. Bottle. I always wonder about that. Like when I sometimes get, wine shipped me and, and I'm like, why is this so heavy? I mean, yeah, yeah there's some one kilo, um, you know, thousand gram uh, yeah. bottles and at 330, you know, I think it's a, it's a great solid bottle. We haven't had any issues mm -hmm. with them, like, you know, easily getting broken or anything, but also, um, yeah, it does, it does save in, uh, well, shipping cost obviously, but actually, you know, fuel for shipping, um, right. is, you know, especially if you're mailing things and, and just plain uh, reduction in, in glass. And, and, and then, recycled. Yeah, and it's recycled yeah. glass. And the, that means the money is going into the wine, not the bottle. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So I have the Cab and the Malbec Rosé. Do you have, um, and you do the Bordeaux grapes. Do you produce a Bordeaux blend? Yeah, yeah, we produce a blend. It's called Corte. Corte mm -hmm. means kind of cut of the vineyard. So it's the winemaker's cut of the of the vineyard. And, and that's us. We... Um, we harvest separately and vinify separately Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Malbec, Petit Verdot. So after a year, you know, all of our reds are a year in barrel. After a year, we go and pull grape samples. Um, I should say wine samples. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they go into little numbered uh, glass jars. And we probably make 20 or 25 different wines, you know, over the course of a day. Uh, exploring, you know, additions and subtractions of different grapes. Uh, in other words, it's not a fixed recipe for our blend. And we kind of arrive at our three favorites and, you know, usually make a slightly bigger bottle, take them home, have a barbecue, uh, crown a winner, and that becomes oh. Corte for the year. So if you've... You oh, know, that's still... kind of fun to do as, as your blending trial. Oh, yeah. It's a good day. There's no... Uh, <laughs> that's always a good day. Um, and I mean, it's super fun, of course. Uh, you know, I think it's some, some wineries you can do a blending experience, right? Where you kind of pay to sit down in a lab at a table and give you samples and everyone kind of makes their own blend. I mean, it's, it's, it's really fun. Um, so when I've taken part in blending trials at a winery, we start, we started with the year before's blend, whatever the percentages uh -huh. was. And then we did that percentage with the current, you know, grape you know stuff in front of us and then did we like that because you know every year is different so yeah. um no we don't like that you know and then subtract and add and this and that and that's how yeah we every i mean you said it every yeah. year is different so if you go through like our tech sheets or on the website the different wines we've created i mean they've been from 45 percent merlot probably the highest merlot to 
you know, 68% cab down to 35% cab. We've yeah. had 29%, I think was the highest Cabernet Franc ever. Sometimes it's eight, sometimes it's zero. Um, you know, we kind of just show the best thing the vineyard could produce that year. And, and the goal is to just do that, not to, you know, really without regard for what it was the year before either, I guess. <laughs> um, but it's fun to do vertical tastings. You know, we've done some events that are corte from multiple years, which mm -hmm. is always great because it's, you know, like tasting the year of the vineyard and what was going on there. And we've also done a lot of, um, like, I love when people take, to me, tasting more than one wine at a time is the best, right? One wine, you can only learn so much. But as soon as you have something to compare it to, things start sticking in your head and it's just a great exercise. So we've done, you know, serve a Cabernet, serve a Cabernet Franc, serve the blend that has a lot of Cabernet Franc and tell them, and, you know, and ask which one of these grapes, like which, which grape of these varietal wines sticks out the most to you in the blend? You know, just things like that. Are just yeah, super, that's kind of cool. Yeah, just that's kind of cool. Education well, how, process. How Andrew. many wines do you produce? You know, you yeah. have... We make the Malbec Rosé, the Gamay Rosé, the Cab, the Chardonnay. Yeah. The yeah, blend. right now we make up to eight wines. Um, okay. Yeah, the two Rosés are the Malbec and the Gamay, the Chardonnay, that's three. And then the Red Blend. We don't do the Red Blend every year. Um, you know, it's longer in barrel. It's longer in bottle before we release it. Mm -hmm. um, it is quite a project to actually get it done. So, you know, we pick years that we think it's going to be great. And that's the year we make a blend. Um and then, yeah, we, we're highlighting the varietals of the farm, the Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, um, Malbec. And we just started last year making a little bit of Petit Verdot on its own, mm -hmm. which is also a wonderful thing for people to try and just say, wow, Petit it Verdot is. on its own. How about that? <laughs> people, people don't understand. Like the two grapes, I think, you know, the Cap Franc and the Petit Verdot are, are two grapes that people, I don't want to say don't understand, but they're overshadowed by the Bordeaux blend and they're great as a standalone yeah yeah it's i mean it's definitely been well received for people to be able to try petit verdot everyone everyone loves it and it's it's been you know fun i haven't heard of that before oh wow what is that you know it's it's in all these wines just not a lot of it and it's and it makes a really nice wine on its own right so is there any wine that is a flagship wine of you know your you know Familia Vincent Pierce is there's a, something that sticks out as a flagship. Um, yeah, to me, a flagship like Familia Vicente Pierce flagship would be something that allows people to get to know us, right? So a product mm -hmm. that really represents the region and you know lets them test us out or whatever. So to me, the flagships are like the three wines that everyone is kind of heard of and willing to try. A red blend, our corte, mm -hmm. Cabernet Sauvignon, and Malbec. Right? Some people don't know about Cabernet Franc. I would say among like serious wine people, our flagship is probably Cabernet Franc or the Gamay. Because everyone wants everyone's curious about that. Everyone wants to try it. All the people that try, you know, hundreds of wines a year in their wine shop or whatever, they all seem to, to be excited about Cabernet Franc because it does so well in Argentina. But yeah, I would say the flagship are the ones that that let people try our wines or try a wine from Argentina for the first time. Or, you know, we do a lot of tastings, you know, we do like a farmer's market tasting in the, in the winter, December here in Buffalo. Um, and, you know, a lot of people come and say, I only drink sweet wines. Do you have any sweet wines? Well, no, we make all dry wines, but this Corte is very fruity. It's our crowd pleaser. Like everyone loves it. It's so balanced and, Okay, I'll try it. Right, and all of a sudden they're like, "Oh, that's good." There, you're yeah, people confuse sweet and fruit. And yeah, fruitiness. like yeah. you're on your way to becoming a dry wine drinker, right? Like yeah. <laughs> this is the gateway drug for sweet wine drinkers, right? <laughs> like there you go. <laughs> right so yeah, I think those are the flagships. And how do you envision the future of your wine portfolio? Are there any new great varieties or styles that you want to explore? Yeah, I mean, the portfolio itself, so like the wines that we make, um, you know, we, we, we want them to be better every year. So that that involves some, maybe some experimenting. I think some of the things I would love to do are 
make a sparkling wine at some point. I think it would be wonderful to have a white sparkling wine. We don't grow the white grapes. So, you know, maybe we would start with a rosé or we, we were in Italy recently and I, I mean, I love Lambrusco sparkling red. I think it would be super cool to have a sparkling red, you know, only available at the winery, only available at the vineyard. That would be super cool. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say like a sparkling. I also, you know, we're, we're thinking maybe a year or so down the road, start to work on having an actual tasting room at the vineyard. And it would be very nice to have kind of the familia reserve or something, you know, a wine that, um, that we don't, we don't sell or we don't even bottle, like have a, a barrel of Merlot, right? Our Merlot is delicious. It's wonderful. It makes a great wine. It's, you know, 35 year old vines. You know, we don't, we don't usually bottle a Merlot on its own just because it's probably a little harder to sell. People abroad are not really looking for a Merlot from Argentina, but to have that kind of, um, you know, on tap at the vineyard, I think would be mm-hmm. awesome. We're also working on a ninth wine, or we'll do like a maybe even a one-off release of a reserve that we made a few years ago that we're keeping probably about two and a half years in barrel uh, and maybe a year in bottle before we release it. So we'll have a reserve Malbec and a reserve Cabernet. Um, <clears throat> and we'll release it to kind of celebrate the Adobe house. I don't know if you've seen a picture of it on our website or anything or on the Instagram, but there's an adobe house with walls, you know, that thick, made of mud, um, painted white on the outside, really pretty, that, that's 100 years old in 2026. So we'll kind of celebrate the 100 years of, you know, this house being around, this property being around, uh, and release um, probably in a 1.5 liter, those two reserve wines, you know, limited quantity. Wow. So that'll that's be another great. fun project we've already, we've already had in the works. That's great. That really is. So, um, as I said, that football brought us together, the uh-huh. Buffalo Bills. Um, has, Buff, has the football influenced anything in your winemaking? Yeah, I mean, I say sports. You know, if you think about Argentina, right, they're just soccer fanatics. I mean, just like right. Buffalo people are about the Bills. Mm-hmm. And it's, there's there's not a lot of difference about of the craziness when you go to the stadium and you know the pregame and the tailgate and the post party. Yeah. I mean it's it's really pretty similar and people you know my dad being so stressed out watching the game and he's to turn the TV off and walk away right I mean it's like uh, <laughs> you know, I missed my exit going to Boston on Sunday <laughs> because I was tuning in the the Bills game on Odyssey so I could listen to it yeah, yeah so people are crazy here and there. So I think that is uh, that's a cool commonality. I mean, we we have um, this Buffalo Buffalo Mendoza sticker, right? Yeah, I saw Buffalo, that. Buffalo, New York, Mendoza, Argentina. You know, it's it's actually the Andes Mountains inside the Buffalo. The, the oh wow, the, I didn't look at it that close. I have it right like, behind me. Year is a moon. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like bringing Buffalo and Mendoza together. I think that's an amazing commonality. I mentioned before that these cities are really similar size and have like a similar feel. Um, you know, they have the wine industry, you know, Buffalo obviously doesn't have that, but, you know, I would but there's say there's a wine are, industry south of Buffalo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the Finger Lakes for sure. And all the grape growing for, um. Did you ever think of collaboration with the Bills on, on the label? Uh, a lot of people have done it already. Um, okay. I haven't thought much yeah. about it. Um, okay. you know, we really just kind of stick to what we do where we have our uh-huh. own philosophy we want to harvest our own grapes we want to make wines that people love and deliver them at an affordable price like offer tremendous value keep it authentic and you know be deeply involved um you know if if something came up of course yeah i would look at it it's not something i've proactively thought about but um one last thing about the bills um my brother-in-law i have three brothers-in-law in argentina juan pablo that we work with and then Alejandro, uh, the middle one, is is a big Bills fan. And he started, oh, right. you know, these Buffalo Bills backers bars around the country, uh-huh. around the world? Yeah. So he has kind of like an informal Buffalo Bills backers uh, out of his house in, in Mendoza and, you know, has people come over for the game and, you know, make sure it's on every, every Sunday. So, oh. uh, yeah, we're creating a new global, a little bit more of a global fan base. Well, if I'm ever in Mendoza... 
yeah. and it's football season, which that's probably when I would be there. I'll, I'll have to get his number. <laughs> I can't even watch the Bills where I am because it's Philly. It's Eagles country. Yeah. So unless it's, you know, whatever. But yeah, definitely reach out. Let us know when you're planning a trip. Oh, de- definitely. Definitely. So um, what one question, like the price points for the wines, the Malbec Rosé, how much would that retail for? I'd say, you know, it obviously depends what state you're in, but it's between right. like 18 and 25 bucks. Oh, that's not bad. And how about the cab? And the reds are between 20 and 28. Okay. Which that's totally all of our reds. Totally affordable. Yeah. 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 Very, very, very nice. Very nice. So I'm going to flip back to Buffalo. How would you pair these wines, the Malbec, uh, Rosé and the cab? with the game day menu. Yeah. I mean, I think one of our classics here is making homemade pizzas with all Mm -hmm. the wines. And that's definitely also a game day thing, especially away games. You have a little time, um, you know, fire up a pizza oven and plan ahead for the dough and throw whatever you want on it. I mean, the wines go wonderfully, you know, they're all balanced. They all have good acidity. They Mm -hmm. all have good fruit. So I love the pizza pairing. Um, you know, Buffalo has its chicken wings. That is absolutely a mm-hmm. you know, famous part of the day. Actually, last Sunday, there was an away game. I took my son to a basketball clinic or something Sunday morning. Mm-hmm. And I got out of the car. It was like 10 o'clock in the morning. And the whole town smelled like chicken wings in the fryer. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> it was amazing. But yeah. And the, we have beef on weck. Beef on weck. Yeah. yeah. Fried bologna. Fried, that's the first time I ever had, and I love fried bologna and buffalo. Oh, yeah, I haven't had that for yeah. decades, but I would <laughs> totally pair that up with some wine. Yeah, I think the the wings are amazing with the Chardonnay or one of the rosés. I don't mm-hmm. love wings with red wine. I feel like it's two things that are kind of big yeah. together. Maybe a barbecue wing. There's actually so many different flavors now that you can yeah. definitely I'm, tra- I'm a traditionalist when it comes to wings. Yeah. I, I like them hot. I like them hot with blue cheese. Uh huh. Or the classic, the classic Buffalo barbecue is also really good. Um, but yeah, with uh, subs, I'm also just thinking. Actually, there's a big Buffalo Mendoza parallel, a charcuterie board. You know, when I was a kid, we would have a loaf of Italian bread, cheese, and some meat. That was like a a Bill's snack in Argentina. You know, a charcuterie board at the beginning of a barbecue at someone's house. Is, is an absolute classic, you know, cheese. We grow olives at our farm too. So cheese, olives, um, you know, cured meats and, and wine. I mean, that is an absolute classic. So for a Bill's pairing, the, uh, the charcuterie board with wine is, is both the Mendoza and Buffalo thing. Great. So are you, where are you distributed in the States where people can find your wines? Yeah, we're in Western New York, um, mm-hmm. South Carolina, with a distributor called Aleph. Uh, We are in Tennessee with Ajax Turner. So Tennessee is mostly Nashville, Chattanooga. Uh, South Carolina is all over the state. We're in a bunch of stores in Hartford. That's something we just got started in Connecticut and also in the Burlington, Vermont area. So those are, you know, current availability. I try to list them. If you, if you go to, I can't remember if it's called buy or where to find FVP, we use mm-hmm. FVP for Families and the Peers, um, you know, keep it short. That's our website, mm-hmm. FVP Wines, and our Instagram. Um, but, yeah, on FVP Wines, the buy or find um, shows kind of a lot of restaurants and stores in each one of the states um, where the wine's available. And it has at the very bottom um, some, some great stores that I know carry a lot of our wines that ship around the country. And do you do direct-to-consumer? We don't. Um, I'm sure hopefully one of your listeners can call me, explain to me how to do it as a foreign winery to to set up an e-commerce business in the U.S. Um, in the U.S., I'm just an importer. So technically, you know, I'm not not really allowed to be sending uh, wines out through the mail. Um, so, yeah, we don't do much, but we do host a lot of events in Buffalo. You know, we have a New York State permit that allows us to register events. Um, so we do some some direct to consumer kind of events like that. And in Argentina, I guess I have to mention, we are working on a quincho, which is an Argentine barbecue house, kind of an outdoor with a roof, you know, picture big wooden timbers, mm-hmm. Argentine wood-fired grill, wood-fired oven, fire pit, 
and then seating for 30 with a little kind of wine bar. And um, that, that should be done in January. And I think we'll start bringing, we've had a lot of tra travel agents that we've met, um, restaurant owners that have wine clubs, wine shops, um, country clubs with wine clubs, you know, ask us if they can visit. So we'll be able to handle 30 people for an authentic Argentine barbecue at the vineyard uh, very soon. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Yeah. That sounds fantastic. Very excited about that. We have our barbecues there anyway. We just bring, you know, saw horses and plywood and we have the grill. Um, so yeah, it'll be a little bit more, uh, a little bit fancier. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Well, I want to thank you for, for reaching out to me and, you know, coming on, uh, uncork your mind and, and telling everybody about your wines and uh, good thing, you know, Bill's mafia hooked us up yeah. together. And um, if I'm up in Western New York, um, I'll, I'll look you up. Yes, <laughs> you're in my, my stomping grounds. Buffalo version of FVP. No, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. It was really, uh, it was really awesome to talk to you. I, I love what you're doing and it's, it's, uh, it's great to keep getting the word out. So I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Everyone. And once again, tell everybody where they can um, find you online. Yeah, FVP Wines is our Instagram. FVP Wines is our website as well. And I'll receive any email, text, or inquiry that you send through there. So I'll make sure I get back to you. All right. Thanks so much. Yeah, my and pleasure. Thanks, Debbie. Yeah. Have a wonderful day, Sean. Same to you. Appreciate Bye -bye. it. Go Bills. <laughs> yeah, go Bill. <laughs> go Bills. <laughs>